Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to week five in this lecture video. I will talk about the topic on arbitration. Arbitration is probably the most one of the or the most one of the most formal uh, processes of alternative dispute resolution, which practically mimics the uh, procedures and processes observed in courts. It is highly adjudicative and determinative, as I will show uh, in this particular lecture vi video. And at the same time, it actually has a very long history in Australia, going back as early as 1904, when the federal government enacted the Conciliation and Arbitration Act of 1904, mainly to focus on uh, the resolution of industrial disputes. Uh, that particular act has since uh, been repealed, uh, I think, in the 1980s. At the same time, arbitration as a way of uh, resolving disputes is uh, pretty common uh, in the international field. For example, uh, the U United Nations Commission on International Trade Law continues to exist. And as I will show, show later on, it is actually on the basis of the model law uh, created by the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law that the, that the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Acts in the various jurisdictions in Australia have actually been patterned. And so the United, United Nations Commission on International Trade Law for example, uh, continues to have a very strong usage among uh, the different member states of the United Nations for the purpose of resolving their international trade disputes. You can imagine even today, there are a lot of disputes among states uh, pertaining to trade and uh, their disputes are often uh, resolved through the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law that uses uh, arbitration. You've, you probably, also, uh, you've probably also seen the use of arbitration in, uh, in another facet of international law, for example, pertaining to the resolution of disputes uh, concerning uh, the, the South China Sea, where it was again a United Nations uh, Commission uh, that, uh, that uh, looked into the way by which the dispute between China the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and other neighboring countries about the use of the China, South China Sea was actually referred to a, a, uh, an arbitration tribunal. So it's, it is in much use. In Australia as well, uh, although we will be focusing on the uh, Uniform Commercial Arbitration Acts across the different jurisdictions, there's actually also the International Arbitration Act of 1974 Commonwealth, with, which focuses on uh, the, the, uh, arbit the, the procedures for arbitration involving international uh, commercial disputes that are then go governed by the International Arbitration Act uh, 1974 Commonwealth. Now, as well, uh, we should also know that because of the, uh, the, the strong international trade that continues to exist, not only across you know, states, uh, state actors, but also among multinational companies and across companies. Again, it is very common uh, for these commercial entities, instead of uh, filing court actions in the various forums of a jurisdiction, which means therefore that there is the possibility that uh, it, the, the, you know, the question of what, which law will apply and what legal processes to follow can become indeterminate and uncertain. And this is the reason why oftentimes a lot of these companies have in their uh, international commercial contracts a clause or provision that any dispute in their uh, international agreement will be, uh, or in the commercial agreement, will be resolved through arbitration. And so uh, that, that will be the focus of our discussion in this lecture video. Our focus, however, will be arbitration in the uh, domestic context, particularly in New Zealand, uh, in Australia. And we shall be focusing on the Co Commercial Arbitration Act 2013 Queensland, although the provisions of the Commercial Arbitration Act 2013 Queensland is actually similar uh, to, the, uh, to the same laws or statute enacted across the, uh, all the other jurisdictions in Australia, which is the reason why uh, these are called the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Acts. And so on completing this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the process of arbitration 
including why uh, you know commercial entities or uh, parties might decide to include uh, arbitration as part of uh, uh, in their contract for the purpose of resolving disputes, or even when uh, there might be a contractual dispute, these parties might then decide that the way forward for them to resolve the dispute would be to uh, undertake arbitration. You should also be able to then uh, discuss and explain the uniform commercial arbitration laws in Australia, as well as the uses of the arbitration process. Let's begin by uh, trying to examine uh, arbitration uh, in relation to mediation and uh, mediation, which we discussed in week four, uh, as well as in, uh, in relation to conciliation, which we will discuss in week six. So we will recall that in relation to mediation, for example, the mediator is uh, mainly has a facilitative role. The role is, or the mediator is facilitative in the sense that he, he facilitates or encourages the parties to reach an agreement by themselves. And as a result, because it is actually uh, ultimately the parties themselves in a mediation process that seeks to arrive at a uh, resolution of their dispute or, a, or an agreement, then it becomes empowering to them. Uh, at the same time, it, you know, mediation proceedings are often also uh, cheaper. Relative, cheaper relative to court proceedings as well as relative to, a, uh, to arbitration. Now, however, although we can say uh, that you know, parties or dispute should strongly consider mediation, it often also does not work in the sense that because it is up to the parties to try to reach an agreement by themselves, if you have a, you know, if you have parties that are pretty recalcitrant or uh, have very strong emotions against each other or are unable to go beyond the uh, adversarial nature of their conflict, then it may be possible for them not to reach an agreement. In which case, if that is the case, then uh, failing mediation, they might have to go to the courts. However, it's, it is not just mediation that the parties can consider as we see in, week, as we will examine in week six, there can also be conciliation and conciliation mainly involves the, the role of a third party who uh, has an advisory uh, role in the sense that the conciliator, as I discussed in the week four video, actually uh, has a stronger role in terms of delineating and identifying what the legal issues might be, and even providing advice, both legal and factual advice in relation to the dispute between the parties. So we will see that from mediation, which involves a facilitative role of the mediator, you can then have the advi advisory role of the conciliator. However, again, because uh, the in many cases, the parties are free to disregard the, uh, the advice of the conciliator, Again, it may be possible that the parties do not reach an agreement because remember, the role of the conciliator is not to make a determination of, about the dispute. He doesn't make a decision. In the end, it's really for the parties to decide whether or not to enter into, a, into an agreement in relation to their dispute. So again, it can also fail. One of the more common uh, ways by which disputes are, are then resolved, especially in the commercial field, is through arbitration which essentially uh, involves a determinative process of dispute resolution. Uh, as we will see later on, arbitration uh, closely resembles the uh, processes involved in courts or even in, in tribunals. And because arbitration uh, may involves an arbitrator who adjudicates on a dispute, it is determinative. So there is a decision actually rendered by an arbitrator. Uh, because it is determinative, as we will see, it becomes less empowering to the parties. It is not for the parties to, uh, the, the parties no longer have a strong role in terms of uh, arriving at a resolution of the conflict, but it is really the arbitrator who makes a decision as to what the respective rights and interests are of the parties. And you will notice, therefore, the focus then is on the, on the legal obligations and the legal rights of the parties based on the law and whatever evidence uh, is then provided by the parties uh, during the arbitration proceedings. 
Now, uh, arbitration uh, proceedings are also more, more costly, as we will see, mainly because uh, the, the parties have to pay for the arbitrator, the parties have to pay for the venue of the arbitration proceedings, they probably have to pay for stenographers and, uh, and others, and so on. Now, if arbitration proceedings uh, are more costly and they're less empowering to, to the parties in the sense that you have an arbitrator, a third person who makes a determination about the conflict, why would uh, parties uh, decide to enter into arbitration either after a conflict has uh, arisen or a dispute has arisen, or at the time that they enter into an agreement or into a contract, they decide that any dispute in their contractual relationship will then be resolved by arbitration. Why might they do this? And that is mainly because uh, arbitration will lead to more certain outcomes in the sense that there will be an arbitrator who will make a decision about the dispute or the conflict. Recall that if you talk about mediation, if the parties are unable to agree, then there is no resolution. They'd have to go to court. And you know, there can, it, it can take a while before the court can even you know, uh, schedule a mention uh, in relation to a particular court application. So the arbitration then, as we will see, provides for more certain outcomes in the sense that the parties know that if they have a commercial dispute, it will be determined, it will be resolved, it will be adjudicated by a, a, uh, an arbitrator. And therefore the parties know what their respective legal rights and obligations will be in relation to a particular conflict or dispute. Now, so in addition, uh, why arbitration? Because one, as I mentioned, it provides certainty of uh, the outcome of a dispute, but at the same time, arbitration provides a dedicated dispute resolution process. Uh, again, you will probably be aware that if parties are unable to resolve their dispute, say through mediation or conciliation, and they, therefore they have to go to the courts, what can typically happen is that given the court backlog, it can take a long while for a court to uh, deal or hear uh, a particular court application or court matter. So it can take a while for, for it to be resolved because a particular application before a court sits alongside hundreds, if not thousands of other cases that a court has to, uh, has to resolve or has to hear. On the other hand, if you deal with arbitration, it is likely the case that the arbitrator or the panel of arbitrators that will be created as a result of the agreement of the parties pertaining to arbitration is one that is dedicated and uh, focused solely uh, uh, towards the adjudication and determination of the dis contractual dispute or the commercial dispute between parties. And for that reason, it is also compar comparably speedy because it is dedicated. You can be sure that within a period of time, uh, the arbitrator or the panel of arbitrators will arrive at a decision. Now, this can be very important uh, in terms of commercial disputes, for example, if you have a building contract or if you have a multi-million dollar or a multi-million, multi-billion dollar uh, commercial contract or, or agreement between uh, parties or several parties. And it might be that there are stages by which, you know, a, a contract has to proceed. If there is uncertainty uh, in relation to a commercial dispute, then it can stop or prevent the, uh, the other parts of the contract from proceeding. And often, uh, you know, uh, time is of the essence in the sense that the parties to a contract would wish to know, uh, you know, who is at fault and what the respective rights and obligations might be. So in that sense, instead of relying uh, on the court system, to make a determination as to what the legal rights and obligations of the parties might be. If you have an arbitrator or a pa panel of arbitrator, there can be a quicker determination uh, in relation to the dispute. More importantly, the advantage of arbitration is that it can be suited to uh, the unique circumstances of a dispute. Oftentimes, uh, you, can have con you can have commercial disputes that involve a lot of uh, complicated and uh, technical issues, which means that you know uh, you might need uh, arbitrators who are experts in the field. It could be uh, arbitrators or experts in the fields of fields of aviation or shipping or uh, fields of uh, 
you know, I don't know, uh, the development of um, drugs, uh, you might have an expert in relation to technology and so on, which you will see uh, would often not be within the ambit of the expertise or skill set of, of judges. And so therefore, with arbitration, the parties to a dispute are in a better position to choose those arbitrators who are in, in a better position to make a determination as to a dispute, not only in relation to the law and the evidence, but the specific technical and uh, knowledge requirements of a dispute. So these would be some of the reasons why uh, oftentimes uh, parties in a commercial agreement decide to uh, you know, include in a written agreement a provision that in the event there is a dispute, they will resort to arbitration. Or even, even if um, they, they may have failed to do that uh, at the time that they conclude an agreement, when a dispute arises, they can then agree to enter into arbitration rather than uh, going straight away to the courts uh, for the purpose of uh, asking the court to resolve a dispute. Notwithstanding the fact that arbitration, as I pointed out, is more costly uh, it might even be more costly uh, than, act, than a, an actual legal proceeding that is lodged or applied uh, or commenced in a court. Now, what are the key features of arbitration? And we will notice that when we examine the key features of arbitration, these features are almost very similar or are, are very similar to the features of uh, the court processes. So number one, arbitration uh, would be formal and legalistic. So in other words, uh, there are procedures that have to be followed. It is more formal in the sense that the, that the parties oftentimes with their counsel or their solicitors have to appear before an arbitrator who has uh, certain powers to make a ruling uh, and uh, powers, even, even, uh, powers even to issue, for example, subpoenas or uh, for the purpose of uh, compelling the parties to uh, provide evidence in relation to a dispute. It is also similar to a court proceeding in the sense that the participants of dispute present arguments and evidence to a dispute resolution practitioner who you know we call the arbitrator who makes a determination. It also most closely resembles litigation in respect of its general formality and the fact that arbitrators must make awards according to law and therefore according to the evidence. It is also adversarial. And so therefore in a general sense, it's almost like a win. You know, uh, the outcome is oftentimes win-lose. Somebody wins and somebody loses. It's adver adversarial in the sense that the parties uh, in an arbitration proceeding seek to win uh, as against the other party or other parties. It is also the most formal uh, of all the non-curial forms of dispute resolution. So when they say non-curial, it is, non-judge based form of dispute resolution. So among those forms of dispute resolution that does not involve a determination by a judge, arbitration is the most formal. As we will see, uh, it is often is also governed uh, by a statutory framework and relies on adjudication by the arbitrator who hands down an award at the conclusion of the arbitration. Now that award is almost equivalent to a court judgment, and uh, it can all it, it can it can only be set aside uh, in the form of an appeal uh, on a question of law, which we uh, look into in a short while. And because arbitration uh, almost resembles a court proceeding, and uh, because arbitration is formal and legalistic, and because the arbitrator makes a determination as to the respective rights and obligation of the parties or the parties, the arbitrator is required to observe the principles of natural justice, which I will examine in greater detail in a short while. But briefly, when you speak of the principles of natural justice, it consists of at least two precepts. One, that uh, the parties must be given an opportunity to be heard. And secondly, that the arbitrator or the third party who makes a determination in an arbitration proceeding is one that is neutral, impartial, and objective. Now, there are at least 
uh, two common forms of arbitration that we will come across uh, in, in Australia, at least domestically. One is the formal dispute resolution process governed, for example, by the Commercial Arbitration Act 2013 or the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act across the different jurisdictions in Australia, in which two or more parties refer their dispute to an independent third person who is the arbitrator for determination. Now, you can also have uh, arbitration actually upon the order of a court, for example, under the Family Law Act of 1975, under Section 13E of the statute, uh, there can be, the court can refer the dispute on a parenting matter uh, to arbitration or in relation to relevant property or financial arbitration. You will also notice that under the Federal Circuit Court Act of 1999 Commonwealth, the Federal Circuit Court can also uh, refer the parties to arbitration. And so therefore arbitration uh, can either be court annexed in the sense that it is ordered by the court or uh, arbitration is something that is decided by the parties themselves. Uh, and we will see uh, when the parties can decide uh, to have their dispute resolved by an arbitrate, arbitrator under the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act. So when I say commercial, Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act, it means it is the same uh, Commercial Arbitration Act that is observed across the different uh, states in Australia, except that each state parliament has enacted its own uh, Commercial Arbitration Act, which is really similar to the Commercial Arbitration Acts of the various states. So uh, as I mentioned, um, you have the Commercial Arbitration, the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act across states, which is modeled after the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, which means therefore that the way that the uh, Commercial Arbitration Act 2013, Queensland, for example, or the, the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Acts across the states are interpreted. They are often interpreted according to tradition or the processes uh, of the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. And as we will see, the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act, and in particular, the Commercial Arbitration Act 2013, Queensland, ap applies to domestic uh, commercial disputes. Okay, what is do I keep on saying 2011? Okay, so under the uh, Commercial Arbitration Act of 2013, Queensland, uh, it provides that this act or the act applies to domestic commercial arbitration. So the, the arbitration has to be domestic and it has to be commercial. So we're going to be looking at these uh, concepts in a short while. So in other words, it doesn't apply to international commercial arbitrations because if it is a commercial, uh, it is an international commercial arbitration, it can potentially be uh, governed by the International Arbitration Act of 1974 Commonwealth. Now, when do we know that uh, an agreement, for example, is one that is considered commercial. Under the Commercial Arbitration Act 2013 Queensland Section 1, the term commercial should be given a wide interpretation as to, so as to cover matters arising from all relationships of a commercial nature, whether contractual or not, and relations, relationships of a commercial nature include but are not limited to the fund transactions, any trade transaction for the supply or exchange of goods or services, distribution agreement, commercial representation or agency, factoring, leasing, construction of works, et cetera. So uh, the Commercial Arbitration Act 2013, Queensland explicitly provides that the term commercial should be given a wide interpretation. Uh, that's commercial in the sense that, you know, what is a commercial agreement as well, as we see uh, in this lecture video. Now, an arbitration is domestic as opposed to an international uh, arbitration, which, as I said, could be covered by the International Arbitration Act of 1974 Commonwealth. So an arbitration uh, is domestic if the parties to an agreement, an arbitration agreement have at the time of the conclusion of that agreement, 
their places of business in Australia and the parties have, whether in the arbitration agreement or in any other document in writing agreed that any dispute that has arisen or may arise between them is to be settled by arbitration and that it is not an arbitration to which the model law applies as given effect by the International Arbitration Act 1974 Commonwealth. So we will notice, for example, under section uh, 13B that uh, for the parties to be able to resolve the dispute by uh, domestic arbitration, that agreement must be embodied in the arbitration agreement or in any other document, but it must be in writing. And we will as well notice that the reference to an arbitration proceeding can be done uh, at the time that the dispute has arisen or at the time that the parties you know, conclude uh, a, a commercial agreement. So even if at the time that the parties enter into a commercial agreement, for example, they have not made any provision about arbitration, there is nothing that will prevent the parties from subsequently agreeing that their dispute uh, be resolved by arbitration for as long as one, the parties have their place of business in Australia at the time of the conclusion of that agreement and the parties have agreed uh, that uh, they will resolve their dispute by arbitration. You should also note the paramount object of the Commercial Arbitration Act and it provides under section 1AC that the paramount object of this act is to facilitate the fair and final resolution of commercial disputes by impartial arbitral tribunals without unnecessary delay or expense. And this act aims to achieve its paramount object by enabling the parties to agree about how their commercial disputes are to be resolved subject to subsection three and such, such safeguards as are necessary in the public interest and providing arbitration procedures that enable commercial disputes to be resolved in a cost-effective manner, informally and quickly. Now, you will again notice that uh, it is a paramount object of the act to enable the parties to agree about how the commercial disputes are to be resolved. This essentially also means that on the one hand, the parties can agree that you know a dispute the commercial dispute between them will, will be resolved by arbitration proceedings. But at the same time, the parties can actually provide for more details about the process and procedure to be followed in the event that they have uh, a dispute and that dispute is to be resolved by arbitration. They can, for example, have a provision in relation to who the arbitrators should be, what their qualifications might be, uh, the, you know, the right of the parties to make an objection as to who can, can be an arbitrator, the parties can also uh, make a provision as to the timing of when the arbitration should, should then uh, be called for, the amount of fees to be paid to arbitrators, and so on. So that can be within the ambit of the, uh, or the scope of agreement of the parties. Now, how is an arbitration agreement defined under the Commercial Arbitration Act 2013, Queensland under Section 7? So an arbitration agreement is an agreement by which the parties to, it's an agreement with the parties to submit to arbitration all or certain disputes. So it could be all the disputes or it could be certain disputes which have arisen or so even if it has arisen, they can, you know, it can be the subject of an arbitration agreement, or which may arise between them in respect of a defined legal relationship whether contractual or not. Number two, an arbitration agreement may be in the form of an arbitration clause in a contract or in the form of a separate agreement. It is however important that the, the arbitration agreement must be in writing. And an arbitration agreement is in writing if its content is recorded in any form, whether or not the arbitration agreement or contract was concluded orally by conduct or by other means. Now, the other question you should be asking is, so what happens if uh, the parties agree to arbitration in the event that there is a dispute, but it is not in writing? Well, that agreement will still be valid because it is a contractual agreement of the parties. It can be binding by the parties, except that 
the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act will not apply. One of the important points we need to remember about the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act across the different jurisdictions in Australia is that, is that these is that the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Acts across all the jurisdictions provide uniformity and therefore certainty as to the process or procedures uh, that can be expected in an arbitration proceeding. So it's not like you know, there are variations as to uh, how arbitration will be conducted across the states if they are governed by the Commercial Arbitration Act. So the problem then is that if there is an agreement between the parties to enter into arbitration, but it is not in writing, or it is not a commercial agreement, uh, then it will not be governed by the uniform by the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act. And the problem then is, uh, the parties will have to uh, make uh, you know will have to uh, make a determination or enter into an into another agreement as to how the arbitration proceeding will proceed, as opposed to being able to rely on the provisions of the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act when the, uh, when the commercial domestic arbitration is one that is covered by the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Acts across the different jurisdictions. Now, what are the uh, key arbitration features under the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Acts and in particular under the Commercial Arbitration Act 2013 Queensland number one? the parties cannot litigate in breach of the arbitration agreement, which we examine in greater detail in a short while. So if there is an, an arbitration agreement, then the parties must undertake arbitration agreement, uh, must undertake arbitration under the Commercial Arbitration Act of 2015. Secondly, arbitral tribunals have more power to protect arbitration proceedings. As I said, they're almost, uh, they almost mimic the power of the courts. Third, uh, you can expect confidentiality. And fourth, uh, judicial review of uh, decisions or judgments handed down by arbitral tribunals. Uh, judicial review is only limited to structural integrity or to questions of law. So in other words, you know, once a judgment uh, or decision is handed down by, the, uh, by an arbitral tribunal, that is the decision uh, and the end of the dispute. And fifth, the, uh, one of the key features, uh, the other key feature would be that it is, uh, there is easy and efficient enforcement of awards. Let's look at the first key feature that parties cannot uh, litigate in breach of the arbitration agreement. Under section eight of the Commercial Arbitration Act uh, 2013 Queensland, a court before which an action is brought in a matter which is the subject of an arbitration agreement must, if a party so requests, not later than when submitting the first, with the party's first statement on the substance of the dispute, refer the parties to arbitration unless it finds that the agreement is null and void, inoperative, or incapable of being performed. Uh, Subsection to provide that when, where an action referred to in subsection one has been brought, arbitral proceedings may nevertheless be commenced or continued and, and an award may be made while the issue is pending before the court. So what it means is that even if there is a commercial uh, agreement that is subject to the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Acts, it does not mean, it doesn't prevent a party or parties from uh, commencing civil proceedings uh, with a court straight away. The only it, that will be permitted, except that under section eight of the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act, when a, an action is brought before the court, one of the parties or any of the parties can make a request that the parties be referred by the court to arbitration. Okay, so it doesn't prevent the parties from, from uh, commencing an action before a court. However, once an application has already been, uh, once an action has already been uh, brought before a court, uh, a party can request a court to refer the parties to arbitration, in which case the court will then have to refer the, refer the parties to arbitration, unless the court finds that the agreement is null and void, it is inoperative or incapable of being performed. 
Now, uh, under Section 9 uh, of the Commercial Arbitration Acts, uh, it also provides that it is not incompatible with an arbitration agreement for a party to request before or during arbitral proceedings from a court an interim measure of protection and for a court to grant the measure. So in that particular case, you will notice that where a civil proceeding has been commenced before a court simultaneous with or prior to the uh, uh, arbitral proceedings, it is possible for the court to simultaneously act in relation to a particular dispute by uh, issuing an interim order or measure of protection, such as freezing orders, for example, about particular assets. Now let's look at uh, the power to protect arbitration proceedings. So while parties have latitude to determine the applicable arbitral procedure, this is constrained by being subject to the provisions of this act, which means therefore that uh, because the, one of the paramount objects of the act is to facilitate, facilitate the fair and final resolution of commercial disputes by impartial arbitral tribunals without unnecessary delay or expense, what it means is that all the parties cannot, for example, uh, outline in their arbitration agreement that the arbitration uh, can only commence, let's say, one year from the time that the dispute has arisen, or state that, uh, uh, you know, it, it, that, the, that the arbitration uh, can only commence by, you know, the, the, uh, once the parties meet certain conditions, if the effect of such will be to uh, lead to a necessary delay of the resolution of the dispute or lead to an unnecessary expense. So as I, as I mentioned, although the parties have strong latitude to determine you know, uh, the applicable arbitral procedure, this is governed and constrained by the requirement of the Uniform, Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act that uh, any such uh, agreement by the parties in relation to the applicable arbitral procedures are subject to the provisions of the act. And if a situation arises in which the party's choice of procedure would result in a necessary delay and expense, then a tribunal cognizant of its duty under Section 1C would be correct in overriding the party's choice to better serve the paramount object of the uh, Commercial Arbitration Act. As well, uh, arbitral tribunals can issue interim measures to protect, to protect the arbitral process and ensure that the arbitration remains effective as a mechanism of dispute resolution. The scope, the scope of such orders is wide and includes such procedural considerations as orders for discovery, the provision of security for costs, the manner in which the arbitral hearings are run and orders as to the preservation of evidence and assets. Now, confidentiality. We know as well, uh, we discussed already uh, in week four and we will discuss in week six that a common feature among these attempts at resolving a dispute outside of the court system are governed by the principles of confidentiality and under the common law. Now this, the principle of confidentiality uh, is made explicit under the Com Uniform Commercial Arbitration Acts and particularly section 27E of the Commercial Arbitration Act, Queensland, uh, in, under Section 27E, for example, subsection one, the provisions of the section apply in arbitral proceedings unless otherwise agreed by the parties. The parties must not disclose confidential information in relation to the arbitral proceedings, and an arbitral tribunal must not disclose confidential information in relation to the arbitral proceeding. When we speak about the, the non-disclosure of confidential information, we often talk in the sense of the possibility that, that confidential, confidential information can be used by one of the parties against another party in a legal proceeding. But actually, uh, under the uh, commercial, Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act, the non-disclosure of confidential information is broader in the sense that uh, when there is confidential information that appears uh, in an arbitration proceeding, which can relate to some uh, trade secrets or some business processes, these two are covered by the rules on confidentiality. So there is a broader uh, 
there is a broader coverage, a wider coverage of what uh, ought not to be disclosed as confidential information under the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Acts. Now, in terms of judicial review, under Section 34A of the Commercial Arbitration Act, an appeal lies to the court only on a question of law arising out of an award if the parties agree before the end of the special of the appeal period that an appeal may be made under the section and the court grants leave. So it has to be an appeal to the court, lies to the court only in a question of law, but at arising out of an award, but also only if the parties agree before the end of the appeal period and the court grants leave. So those are also twin requirements, agreement of the parties, which means that if the parties don't agree, because for example, the, the, the winning party in arbitration proceeding refuses to uh, allow uh, an appeal to the court, then in that case, that's the end of it. Uh, it cannot be appealed because it requires the agreement of the parties and also the, uh, the leave of court. Under section 34A, subsection three, the court must not grant leave unless it is satisfied that the determination of the question will be substan will substantially affect the rights of one or more of the parties, and that the question is one which the arbitral tribunal was asked to determine, general. Now, the fifth feature of uh, arbitration proceedings uh, would be that the would be about the efficient, the easy, and efficient enforcement of awards. So, an arbitral award, irrespective of the state or territory in which it was made, is to be recognized in the state as binding and on application writing to the court is to be enforced subject to the provisions of the section in section 36. So in other words, once an arbitral decision is uh, handed down, it is binding upon the parties. And if the parties, uh, if the winning party then applies to the court for its enforcement, it will have to be enforced under the Commercial Arbitration Act 2013. Okay, now, uh, what are the other provisions under the uh, Commercial Arbitration Act? And we don't have the time to go through all of those provisions, but uh, under the Commercial Arbitration Act 2013, it provides for the appointment of arbitrators, which we'll examine shortly. It also talks about the grounds for challenge of appointment of arbitrators, the challenge of procedure, the failure or impossibility of an arbitrator to act. The uh, Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act also provides for the jurisdiction of arbitral tribunals, including competence to rule on its jurisdiction, the power of the arbitral tribunal to order interim measures, the contract, the conduct of arbitral proceedings, and the power of arbitral tribunal in matters of evidence. So, you know, it's a it's a lengthy uh, statute, which I would invite you to have a look at. But we won't be able to cover them in detail in this particular lecture video. Let's just talk about the appointment of arbitrators under section 11 of the Commercial Arbitration Act 2013. So under, subsection, under section 11, subsection two, the parties are free to agree on a procedure of appointing the arbitrator or arbitrators subject to the provisions of subsections four and five. Now, failing such an agreement, if an arbit, if an in an arbitration with three arbitrators and two parties, each party is to appoint one arbitrator, and the two arbitrators so appointed are to appoint the third arbitrator. So, again, the beauty of having uh, arbitration uh, arbitration governed by the Commercial Arbitration Act is that it actually clearly sets out what can be expected in an arbitration proceeding, including the procedure of appointing the arbitrator. If the parties were to enter into, you know, were to agree to an arbitration, but the arbitration uh, is not covered by the Commercial Arbitration Act, for example, because it is not in writing, then the, the parties will need, for example, uh, to agree on how to choose the arbitrators. Now, uh, in relation to uh, the appointment of arbitrators, where there is all, only uh, one arbitrator, if the parties are unable to agree on the arbitrator, an arbitrator is to be appointed on the request of a party by the court, and so on. Okay. Now, moving on, what are the powers of the arbitral tribunal in matters of evidence? Under Section 19 of the Commercial Arbitration Act 2013, the power conferred on the arbitral tribunal includes the power to determine the admissibility 
relevance, materiality, and weight of evidence, which you will notice uh, means really uh, focuses on the formal powers of an arbitral tribunal, which, which really mimics that of the court system, which looks into issues of admissibility, relevance, materiality, and weight of evidence. Under subsection four of section 19, the power conferred on the tribunal also includes the power to make orders of give or give directions for the examination of a party or witness on oath or affirmation. And for the purpose of the exercise of the power referred to in subsection four, the arbitral tribunal may, deter, may, may administer any necessary oath or take any necessary affirmation. Now let's, I'm sure we're almost done uh, in this lecture video. Let's look at the form of awards under section 33 of the Commercial Arbitration Act of 2013. So in terms of uh, the form of the award, the, arbitration, the arbitrator shall make the award in writing. He or she must sign the award and include in the award a statement of reasons. So you will notice there is a requirement that there has to be a statement of reasons because that uh, provides an opportunity for a court, for example, assuming that the parties agree uh, to appeal a, an arbitral decision on a question of law and the court grants leave of that appeal, the court will then be able to look at the reasons behind the decision to make a determination uh, as to whether or not the decision uh, is compliant with the law. So finally, we're gonna to have to talk about briefly procedural fairness and natural justice. So as I've already indicated, uh, arbitration proceedings closely resemble the uh, court processes, but more importantly, arbitrators make adjudicate, make determinations, they adjudicate on a dispute, acting like a judge. So arbitrations, arbitrators therefore, or arbitration proceedings are done in a judge-like manner. And for this reason, it is a requirement that uh, in arbitration proceedings, the arbitration proceedings or the arbitrators conduct the proceedings according to the, to the principles of procedural fairness or natural justice. Now, there are two twin requirements um, pertaining to the requirements of procedural fairness and natural justice. One is that the parties must be given an opportunity to be heard. So a, uh, in general, uh, a, an arbitrator must always give the parties an opportunity to be heard. And so therefore, for example, if there is a reasonable request on the, one of the, on the part of one of the parties to adjourn a particular uh, arbitration hearing for valid reasons, then the arbitrator must strongly consider allowing such, uh, such an adjournment. At the same time, it is a requirement that the arbitrators uh, must show uh, that they are impartial and that they are objective. So this is impartiality and objectiveness, not only in the sense that they actually are impartial and objective, but at the same time, they must be seen by the parties as being impartial and objective. So arbitrators shouldn't be, uh, should, should, should not be you know, meeting uh, separately with any of the parties should not be friends with other party with with any of the parties because that will be in breach of the principle of procedural fairness and natural justice. And so, on completing this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the process of arbitration, the uniform commercial arbitration laws, and the uses of the arbitration process. And with that, I thank you for watching this lecture video. Bye now.